As the Great Plains were being settled in the late 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was exploding in America's large cities. In this section, we'll give an overview of the period, summarizing some of the uh, major changes to the economy and society. Now, in a simple sense, the Industrial Revolution was the use of power-driven machines to greatly incre increase production, which drove down prices and created jobs and, you know, made the economy boom. Factories, interchangeable parts, assembly lines, and increased urbanization all characterized the Industrial Revolution. America was particularly well-suited because it had a lot of raw materials and an exploding population. While America has all, it always had its landed gentry, the Industrial Revolution spawned a new class of super wealthy like the nation had never seen before. They built these humongous Victorian style mansions with the latest amenities, and they began to have things like second homes or, or cottages at the beach and to take extended, months long vacations in Europe. The super wealthy began to see themselves as a separate, distinct class, and they formed clubs and organizations to define themselves. They established things like country clubs or yacht clubs, riding clubs, and the ladies formed garden clubs. Many became philanthropists, giving large gifts to things like operas and museums. The super wealthy employed live-in domestic servants who did their cooking, cleaning, and driving. Children were given trust funds and the daughters had debutantes. The wealthy stressed the social graces to further distinguish themselves. The first official listing of the wealthy elite in New York City was dubbed the Social Register and was founded in 1888. Now all this is not to suggest that social mobility had broken down. Indeed, it was just the opposite. The new wealthy were just that. They were new captains of new industries. And new wealth usually wants to flaunt itself. To a large extent, the middle class also benefited. The new industries meant new management jobs in the large corporate bureaucracies. No longer were the middle class just doctors, lawyers, merchants, but by the thousands, mid-level managers, accountants, clerks, chemists, engineers, and so forth. These salaried ranks, working on a regular schedule, increased sevenfold after the Civil War. This is when you start hearing the phrase white collar because workers wore white shirts uh, when they wore ties, and that signified sort of uh, management. Blue collar uh, and other colored shirts represented the working class. The growing middle classes were able to afford new houses in the new suburbs. Here they often built their home back from the road, creating a front yard and thus emulating the wealthy landed estates where the manor house had been in the middle of the land. The new suburbs afforded the latest amenities like hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing, new electrical appliances like the Singer sewing machine, and the first mass-produced canned foods. With their growing wealth, fewer middle-class women had to work. Middle-class women were increasingly seen as managers of the household. You uh, begin to see magazines for women at home, including Ladies Home Journal and Good Housekeeping, both of which began in the 1880s. In stressing the importance of family life to the middle class, privacy was crucial. The new suburban homes often emulated the wealthy with ornate decorations and their so-called parlors. They're privately insured with drapes in the window. The Industrial Revolution was also characterized by rapid urbanization. By 1900, one in five Americans lived in cities of 100,000 or more. The cities not only expanded outward into the new suburbs, but upward with new uh, skyscrapers. Before the Civil War, the tallest buildings could only be around five stories because the weight of the taller stories would crush the mortar and brick below. In the late 19th century, the higher buildings were possible because of uh, the availability of steel girders, mass-produced durable plated glass, and the elevator. The first thing to be built was a skeleton of steel, and thus, unlike before, the walls didn't support the total structure. The first so-called skyscraper to be built on this principle was a 10-story home insurance building in Chicago, built in 1885. Soon, most major cities had skyscrapers and, by early 1900s, some were uh, 50 to 60 stories high. Chicago initially led in the number of skyscrapers, even pioneering the so-called Chicago School of Architecture whereby the steel-supported skyscrapers attempted to combine aesthetic concerns with commercial practicability, often with shops and restaurants on the lower floors and rented office space above. The greater urban density of the late 19th century meant the expansion of mass transit. The first mass transit had been the so-called omnibuses. 
stagecoaches modified for local service, and then horse cars, uh, you know, wagons on iron rails pulled by horses. After the Civil War, cities like Chicago experimented with steam-powered light rail on elevated tracks, or some, like San Francisco, experimented with cars pulled by underground cables. By the end of the 19th century, electric streetcars were expanding, first employed in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, they were soon called trolley cars and were the rage in, in every major city. In the 1890s, cities such as Boston and New York began putting electric uh, cars underground on rails, the, the first American subways. The New York City subway opened in 1904 and went the length of Manhattan. Hundreds of iron and steel bridges went up in the late 19th century, replacing earlier wooden structures. Most notable was the Eads Bridge crossing the Mississippi River, built in 1873. The Brooklyn Bridge in New York City was built in 1883 and remains an iconic New York City landmark. It was particularly unique because it was one of the first suspension bridges, which was considered an engineering marvel. Of course, not all was good in the booming urbanizing economy. There was a considerable downside as well, and many Americans suffered greatly. The constant pressure to compete by cutting costs and prices meant cheaper products, but also efforts to eliminate rivals and create monopolies. The failure of the money supply to keep pace with productivity drove up interest rates and restricted the availability of credit. It made borrowing harder. Now all of this promoted extensive consolidation of wealth. The dominant laissez-faire attitude of government contributed to the consolidation of wealth. The term laissez-faire was drawn from a French meaning let us do as we want and it was popularized by the 18th century economist Adam Smith. It generally meant little government interference in the free market. In other words, the government didn't re really or readily tax or, or regulate the economy. With little regulation of business in the late 19th century, the uninterrupted consolidation of wealth and power left many American workers unprotected from exploitation. These workers soon protested, and the American labor movement was born. In addition, the American farmers suffered in the Industrial Revolution. Not coincidentally, it was an age of considerable fraud and corruption as well. With many workers suffering with no protections and with greed unchecked, Many critics spoke of robber barons, a term originally applied to medieval barons on the Rhine River who charged ships to pass. Viewing the pitiful losers of the Industrial Revolution, the poor workers and the farmers, alongside the new ostentatious superclass of wealthy, the satirist Mark Twain spoke of the late 19th century as the Gilded Age, implying that all that glitters is not gold. In short, to understand the Industrial Revolution, one must grasp the new technologies and developments that drove the booming economy, as well as the men who made it possible, the captains of the new industry. One must also explore the flip side of the coin, just how elements of society were hurt by the change in economy, the workers and the farmers, and how they tried to address their concerns. It is not a simple tale. This concludes the introductory overview of the Industrial Revolution.